Ah, welcome. Welcome, kindred traveller. Yes, just the two of us. Quiet on the, um, on the night carriage. I was just thinking that myself, it is rather, rather tr ch chilly. Ah, uh, you recognize me. Very few recognize me. And fewer still when they recognize me are happy to do so. I see. I see, well, I'm rather flattered, actually. Ah, so which, which would be your favorite of mine? You know, this is one of the most underrated. The critics, they hated that, but it was actually my favorite as well. Kindred spirit. Huh. Yes. And so what is it you do, my friend? Are you also a writer? Ah, yes. It must be rather fascinating. Oh yes, this... This is, um... It is. I was just reading over it, actually. It's, um, I think it is done. I've made all the cor corrections I wish to make. Yes, it should be with my publisher in the morning. No, that's not cheeky at all. That would not be an imposition. It's a long journey. Why not? Yes, why not? Fine. Yeah. You will be the first song to have ever heard it. You can tell me what you actually think. Agents never tell you what they think. I call this one the Telltale Heart. Ready? True, nervous, very, very, dreadfully nervous, I had been. Damn. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard, I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily how heartily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. 
For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes. It was this. He had the eye of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. What do you think so far? Thank you. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution. With what foresight. With what dissimulation. I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole weeks before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it. Oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed that no light shone out, and then I thrust my head in. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly. I moved it slowly. Very, very slowly. <laughs> that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening, so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Would a madman have been as wise as this? And then, when my head was well into the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, for the hinge is great. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray of light fell upon the vulture's eye. Is it still okay? Do you think? What do you think? Oh, thank you. I shall continue then. Yeah. Oh, we? This I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed. And so, it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. 
So you see, he would have been very profound all man indeed, to suspect that every night, just about twelve, I looked upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watcher's mint hand would move more quickly than my own. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own power my own sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there was an opening in the door, little by little, and he not to even dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea. And perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was black as pitch, with thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through a fear of robbers. And so that I knew he could not see the opening of the door. And I kept pushing it on steadily. Steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bread. In bed crying out. Who's there? Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I said nothing. I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up, in the bed listening, just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watching in the wall. Presently, I quite like this next bit, my life. Presently, I feel, I feel like it really um, nails the madness that I was going for. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and it knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt. And I pitied him. Although I chuckled in my heart. I knew that he'd been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. 
His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He'd been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He'd been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or, it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions. But he'd found all in vain. All in vain because death, in approaching him, had stoked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of that unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard it, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down. I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length, a simple dim ray like the thread of the spider shot from the crevice and fell upon the vulture's eye. It was open wide. Wide. Wide open. And I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones but i could see nothing else of the old man's face or person for i had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon that damned spot and have i not told you that what you mistake for madness is but an acuteness of the sense. Now, I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. What do you think so far? Still good? Okay, and you would tell me if it wasn't. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held my lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meanwhile, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder with every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? 
as I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now at the dead hour of night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder. And I thought the heart must have burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. That sound would be heard by my neighbour. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, only once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not have been heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes. He was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment the body. The night waned, and I walked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber, and I deposited all between these catlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been way too wary for that. A tub had caught all. Ha! Ha! Is that okay so far? Not too, not too gruesome, is it? Oh, well, thank you. When I had made an end of these labours, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight, and the bell sounded. The hour there came knocking on the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by my neighbour during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused information had been lodged at the police office and they the officer had been deputed to search the premise i smiled for what and i had fear i bade the gentleman welcome the shriek i said was my own in a dream the old man i mentioned was absent in the country. 
it took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search and search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room. I desired them here to rest from their fatigues while I myself, in the wild audacity of perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted a familiar thing. But, ere long I felt myself pale and wishing them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still, they chatted. The singing became more distant. It continued and became more distant. I talked more freely to get rid of the, get rid of the feeling. But it continued and gained definiteness until at length I found the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was low, dull sound. Much that of the sound a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I rose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulations. But the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy side strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved. I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose above all and continued to increase. Louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard it not? Almighty God, no. They heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could beat those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed, tear up the planks, here, here. It is the beating 
of his hideous heart. So pray tell me honestly, what did you think? You are too kind. Oh, gladly. Yes. That makes sense, yes. And yet, the stop cut is this, would this be your enlightening? Well, we come at perfect time then. I hope the publisher enjoyed it as much as you did. And I wish you good luck on your travels. I have a few hours on this coach. Miles to go. Before I get to my inn. So I bid you good travels, and I thank you for your kind words. Perhaps we might meet again if you take this carriage often. Yes, indeed, likewise. kind person. Yes, what a kind soul.